for 66 chapters, Isaiah and his students laid out a devastating legal case against the leaders of Israel. Uh, Isaiah is acting like a lawyer on behalf of God. <coughs> Isaiah does this because the fledgling nation of Israel had settled into relative security by defeating many of their rivals and by shifting from a, uh, a wandering tribe to eventually becoming a more stable agricultural people. And this created a new economy which yielded a lot of economic benefits. The trouble was that only a small number of people at the top saw the benefit of the new wealth of this nation. When Isaiah walked the temple court of ancient Israel, the Israelites had made quite a mess of things. The wealthy were oppressing the poor and crushing the needy. A lot of people needed a place to live and had no home. The poor paid very heavy taxes on their grain, and they often had to bribe corrupt officials to get anything done. The system of tribal land ownership that was enshrined in the book of Leviticus had begun to break down as this new wealthy class emerged. These people stole land from the families that originally held it and exploited them. So the injustice that upset Isaiah so much is a direct corollary to the new wealth of Israel. The covenant that God had made with Moses and Israel envisioned a land in which people shared all that they had in which everyone had enough food. But Israel was starting to look a lot more like the empires that surrounded it. While all this was happening, the upper classes were pouring a lot of their monopolized wealth into spectacles of sacrificial and liturgical worship. They staged increasingly elaborate and archaic religious rituals in the temple. Basically, they spent a lot of their money on church. They sacrificed bulls and lambs and goats, and they sacrificed a lot of grain. They marched around the temple court in solemn processions and sent clouds of incense billowing up into the heavens. The priests led great festivals that celebrated the new moon and the harvest and other seasons. And they prayed and prayed and prayed in the temple. Isaiah finds this last thing, all, all the prayer, especially troublesome. And he paints a stark picture of the incongruous relationship between the way most people lived and the way the privileged people worshipped God. Stretching out one's hands was a traditional posture of prayer. But Isaiah says, your hands are full of blood. All of this ritual, all of the sacrifice, all the time that people spent at the temple, all the time they spent in church, was meaningless to God, Isaiah said, because the people did not practice what they preached and because they ignored the plight of the poor people all around them. Now, I don't think that Isaiah thought worship itself was bad. After all, Isaiah is speaking from within the temple, which is the center of worship. But Isaiah clearly believed that inconsistency between how we treat God on the Sabbath and how we treat people the other six days of the week was really offensive to God and ultimately kind of hollow. Liturgy in the church, divorced from justice in the streets, violates the covenant that God had made with Israel. These ancient leaders sought or thought that their glorious worship in the temple <coughs> fulfilled the first few commandments put no God before Yahweh, worship only Yahweh, and keep the Sabbath holy. But they forgot about a whole bunch of the other commandments, the ones about murder and theft and lying and coveting. And for Isaiah, paying attention only to the first few commandments and ignoring the rest meant that these people would reap God's anger. Now at this point, I want to get into my fancy priestly time machine and race 800 years into the future to the time in which the New Testament was written. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Gospel of Matthew. Because the Gospel of Matthew 
summarized these covenants which the Israelite leaders were having difficulty with. If you remember, uh, there's a story when a man comes up to Jesus and asks Jesus which of the commandments is the most important. And Jesus replies, <coughs> You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I think Isaiah would say that the ancient Israelites were trying to fulfill the first commandment, but they failed utterly at fulfilling the second one. Isaiah would say that claiming to love God is meaningless if you don't also love your neighbor. Now, once again, I'm going to get back in my time machine and this time zoom ahead to the 16th century to Reformation England and see how this starts to work itself out then. Uh, back in the 16th century, the emerging Anglican church was trying to figure out what it meant to be Christian. So here, uh, this is the quick, easy, qu this is the easiest quiz you're going to get all week. Which king was it that started things rolling for the Anglican church? Henry VIII, good, all right. We were all paying attention in middle school. So, if you remember, Henry VIII was Catholic, and he wanted to get a divorce. divorce. He also wanted to get a lot of money, the backside in a lot of history. The Catholic Church controlled all the monasteries, which controlled a lot of land and wealth, and Henry grabbed all of that. Uh, so he took the church from the Catholic Church, and uh, it became a Protestant church. The thing was, by the end of Henry's life, he had basically reverted to being a Catholic in terms of doctrine and worship. He just wanted to be Catholic, uh, but also holding the purse strings. 